This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. Military escalation has continued on the Turkish-Iraqi borders. Turkish armories shelled a Kurdish village 30 kilometers inside the Iraqi territory. The shelling focused on a village in the Dahuk province. The Turkish army said that the shelling came as a response to an attack which came from within the Iraqi territory and should not be considered as the beginning of an anticipated incursion into the Iraqi borders. A new Turkish shelling of a Kurdish village in northern Iraq came amidst confrontations with Kurdistan Workers' Party, PKK rebels, who are centralized there. The residents of the village said the shelling was continuous during a notable escalation by the Turkish army, which has amassed nearly 60,000 troops along the Iraqi borders. All day they are shelling, tanks, armorers, everything. Even in the middle of the night, when we are sleeping, you'll find that balls have been broken and the house is shaking. On the other side of the border, specifically in the Sharnak province, the Turkish villagers talk about the Turkish army's increased shelling of specific locations in the mountains where PKK rebels are known to hide out. We heard a loud noise coming from there. I think they were launching mortar shells that exploded later. The Turkish army announced that its military activities on the borders are a response in kind to the operations of the Kurdish rebels. Some observers say that the border areas will become a theater for the increased attacks and limited counterattacks, at least in the next few days. This comes in anticipation of a political decision from Ankara about carrying out a major military operation in northern Iraq, which could include a wide-scale ground attack and an intense air raid. The anticipated decision appears to be in the hands of the parliament, which will consider a request from the Erdogan government to authorize the decision to carry out this operation next week. However, the anticipated authorization that Erdogan will receive does not mean that the Turkish army will definitely cross the border. Turkish officials say the situation depends on the PKK and operations it may carry out against Turkey. Officials say that any operation similar to the Ankara explosions of last May, when tens of people were killed and wounded, will compel Erdogan to order his army to begin attacks inside the Iraqi territory. However, if the rebels do not carry out sensitive or effective attacks, it's anticipated that Erdogan's threats to use force will suffice. According to a Turkish source, the Erdogan government has refused to offer a pledge to American officials who visited Ankara yesterday that it would not carry out an attack on rebels in Iraq's Kurdistan region. It appears that the situation will depend on how much pressure the Kurdish Iraqis and the Americans will place on the rebels so as to keep them from provoking Turkey by carrying out more painful attacks. The High Committee in Kirkuk began issuing checks to Arab families that were forcefully moved to the area by the former regime. However, citizens have complained about the way in which they are being compensated. More details with Tutin Bezra Khan in the following report. The Kirkuk High Committee resumed its implementation of Article 140 of the Constitution by issuing checks as compensation to Arab families that were forced to move to Kirkuk by the former regime. These families submitted their applications to the High Committee in Kirkuk several months ago. They expressed their desire to go back to their homes as soon as they received their compensation. After we 
we verified the applications, we decided to compensate a number of families that were forced to live in Kirkuk. These families now want to return to their original homes. We have prepared ourselves by issuing compensation checks for them. All the checks are now ready. We called these families and asked them to visit the office so they can take their checks. وشكى عدد من المواطنين من الذين كانوا سجلوا أسماءهم لاستلام مبلغ التعويض. A number of citizens who registered their names to receive compensation complained of corruption. They complained that some people were moved along ahead of others, which is unfair, especially considering that as soon as families apply for compensation, their files are transferred to their home province, and therefore they have no choice but to return to their home province if they want to receive benefits, food, and aid. There were several mistakes made. For example, some people who continue to receive food have also been called to receive compensation. I have not received any compensation by the fact that I stopped receiving my benefits in July. This makes it very hard for me because I'm unemployed. My files were transferred to my original hometown and my food aid was cut. Despite all this, I still have not been compensated. My files were transferred to my original hometown in 2006. I applied for residency for my kids, but they have been denied denied residency and thus they couldn't attend the schools here. I applied for compensation. They transferred my file to my original hometown. The people that were behind me received their compensation, but I have not received anything. We urge the government to help these people and review their files. We want the provinces such as Kirkuk and others to coordinate with one another in order to make it easier for people. According to the High Committee in Kirkuk, compensations will be paid in phases. Each phase will compensate 100 people at a time. Time. So far, compensation checks have been issued to only people in the first phase. Tutan al Barzergan, al Sumeria Kirkuk. Russian President Vladimir Putin has ended the controversy that has been following him ahead of the summit of the Kazwin Sea countries. He confirmed that he will be visiting Tehran. Previously, the Kremlin had stated that the Russian president's visit to Tehran was unconfirmed after Russian intelligence agencies received information that there were plans to assassinate Putin using suicide bombers. Putin's confirmation came during a press conference in Germany with the German Chancellor Angela Merkel after consultations that focused on political issues and the escalating tension between Moscow and Washington, in addition to the Iranian nuclear program. Putin's visit to Iran will be of special importance. More details in the following report. News about the preparations to assassinate the Russian President Vladimir Putin during his historical visit to Iran overshadowed the anticipated summit of the leaders from the countries bordering the Kazwin Sea, including Iran, Russia, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, and Turkmenistan. The leaders are expected to discuss their differences over how to divide the resources of the Kazwin Sea, especially the oil reserves. Putin's visit will be of great importance, but it was unknown whether it would take place. A source from Russian intelligence confirmed that there was credible information that Putin's visit to Tehran would be surrounded by danger. However, the Iranians rushed to absolutely deny this information. The report, which has been spread by some media outlets about suicide bombers preparing to assassinate the Russian president here in Tehran, is absolutely baseless. The Iranians who are suffering from greater diplomatic isolation are heavily relying on Putin's visit. The Russian president is waiting to speak with President Ahmadinejad to find a diplomatic resolution to the Iranian nuclear file. In return for Russia acceptance of Iran's right to use nuclear energy, Iran will be urged to open its nuclear program to international inspectors. Perhaps Putin and Ahmadinejad's discussions will ease tensions between the countries, especially since Iran believes that Russia has delayed the construction of the Bushawar nuclear plant. The relationship between the two countries has been fragile over the past six months because of this delay. However, this is no surprise considering their historical unstable relationship. After decades of wars and tension, 
Tehran's relationship with Moscow has witnessed relative warming after the Islamic Revolution took place in Iran. The relationship became notably worse after the Soviets invaded Afghanistan and supported Baghdad during the Iraq-Iran war. After the Soviet Union collapsed and after facing increased pressure from the West, Iran has begun to share Moscow's pulse about increasing cooperation between the two countries. Relations between the two countries developed to include Moscow supplying Iran with advanced weapons and providing assistance in construction of the Bushawar nuclear plant. Khalid Awith, Al Arabiya. Between the last Moroccan city and the first Mauritanian city lies a desert area that is not under either country's control. The area, which has become known as Bilalstan, is ruled by a powerful man named Bilal, who maintains an international reputation and enforces his own laws. Bilalstan has become a safe haven for undocumented immigrants, drug traffickers and outlaws, as well as those looking for a market to sell banned goods and forged immigration documents. Mahmoud Mohammed reports from we left Morocco a short while ago and are still waiting to enter into Mauritania. We're now stranded in a remote, arid area in the kingdom of Bilalistan. All the roads will either lead to areas planted with mines or to the palace of Bilal. Bilal is also known as the king of the desert. The process of entry into Bilalistan is very complicated and the guards often deny entry to the media. In this inspection area, hundreds of cars and goods are still waiting, pending permission from Bilal to enter. Bilal is a very popular man and is well known worldwide. Many people from Europe come to Bilalistan and leave their cars in Bilal's care while visiting Mauritania and Senegal. I do not know whether Mauritania or Morocco will be able to take control here. And until this happens, we are the officers of the law. It is true this area is very dangerous, but thank God I haven't had any problems here. As you travel throughout Bilalistan, you can easily run into a drug trafficker or an undocumented immigrant. I will cross into Spain via Morocco under the protection of Bilalistan, where both Morocco and Mauritania lacked sovereignty. Bilalistan has become a safe haven for outlaws, including illegal traders and smugglers of cars and goods, as well as drug traffickers. In fact, some are often forced to spend a night or two in the desert inside of a cool container and amidst the stray dogs of Bilalistan. Bilal has prohibited us from filming in his kingdom. Now we must leave quickly because the area is indeed very dangerous, especially since we are not under the protection of the king. Mahmoud Mohammed, Dubai TV, from the international desert between Mauritania and Morocco. Residents of Nar al Bared return to the new camp at a rate of 10 families per hour. The waters of al Bared resumed their course this morning. Some refugees said farewell to other refugees in the al Badawi refugee camp. But there are many who are staying, standing behind barbed wire watching their neighbors return to al Bared. Where were you living? In Safor. No, while they were attacking the camp? In Ataya. Where did you live when you left the camp? We hid in different places. Where did you live when you went to Bidawi? At the school here. Are you happy to be going home? Has your house been shelled? We don't know. 
حلم محمد بالعوده الى البارد اصبح ممكن محمد's dream of returning to al-barid is now possible the road between bidawi and al-barid is paved with the onurwa and ngo cars standing by things seemed easy until we reached the eastern border of the camp where we found a new kind of boundary with checkpoints and people being asked for their passing permits <laughs> Uh, 800 families will be allowed back, about 100 families a day, at the rate of 10 families per hour. Only those with a permit from the Lebanese army headquarters in the north will be allowed to do so. We think that there's a bit of confusion, and we hope that it's not overshadowing a bigger problem. We also want to emphasize that we are returning to the camp of return. Nar al Bared is the camp of return from which will be the big return to Palestine. The living conditions in the camp are very difficult as a result of the damage and destruction. This man crossed the border after much suffering, and while waiting, this child started chewing his fingers as if regretting his future, which he cannot participate in creating. I would say things, but people won't like it. Just say them. No, I won't. Just say them. If you want to film, go into the camp and film my house. They're not letting us go in, so say what you have to say. No, I'm educated and I talk a lot. Come to my house and I will tell you what's on my mind. We were unable to visit the man's house. We waited a long time to go into the camp, which resulted in nothing more than observing people being searched and seeing the anticipation and hope in the eyes of the children who did not know what awaited them in their homes. Do you know if your house has been demolished? I don't know anything about it. How are you feeling right now? I'm praying to God that at least something is left. So are you happy or afraid? I am happy to be going back to my home, but I'm afraid that I might not find anything left. We're happy. It's as if I'm going back to Palestine. We're very happy because we've suffered a lot since we left. We wish to die in our camp, then be forced to leave it. The return to the camp of return, this is the last voyage of the painful adventure of Nahr al-Barid, a voyage that al-Barid citizens hope will never be repeated unless it leads them to Palestine without camps and journalists standing along the periphery. From the eastern entrance of Nahr al-Barid, Yad'i Bess, New TV. Rice is in Ramallah meeting the Palestinian president, but progress is apparently slow. And America's top diplomat says there's still a lot of work to do. Both are trying to lay the groundwork for next month's summit due to be held in the United States. But Rice said more bilateral talks are needed before the Middle East Peace Quartet can join the table. We've not uh, issued invitations because uh, we want the work of this, um, this bilateral track to continue uh, very aggressively moving toward that international meeting. But um, I think we made some clarifications of the nature of this meeting when I was in New York. Uh, we made some clarifications of those that we would expect uh, to invite to be involved. And I just want to repeat what the President said in an interview that he recently gave to Al Arabiya, which is that this is going to be a serious and substantive conference that will advance the cause of the establishment of a Palestinian state. Dr. Rice has explained that the agenda should be drafted ahead of the meeting and this conference should not be a photo opportunity. Everything should be clearly formulated during the conference and after the meeting we should resume negotiations according to a timeline in order to prepare for a peace agreement. But while plans for a Middle East peace conference are being put in place, the UN's human rights envoy for the Palestinian territories is painting a gloomy picture. John Dugard is accusing the quartet of Middle East mediators of bias against the Palestinians. He says every time he goes there, the situation seems to be getting worse. And he's told Al Jazeera the United Nations should withdraw from the quartet unless Palestinian human rights concerns are addressed. On past performance, the quartet comprising United Nations, European Union, Russian Federation and the United States has been too unconcerned about 
human rights issues. One only has to look at the uh, statements issued by the Quartet every couple of months, which do not seriously address human rights issues. For instance, the Quartet has never even mentioned the 2004 advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice, which sets out the legal framework for dealing with the uh, Palestinian territory. So I believe that if the United Nations is not able to persuade other members of the quartet, particularly the United States, to show more concern for human rights, to acknowledge that Israel is a serious violator of human rights and in serious violation of international law, then, and then only, I believe that the United Nations should give serious uh, consideration to withdrawing from the quartet. For more on this, let's go to Al Jazeera's David Chater, who's in Ramallah. Uh, David, hearing Mahmoud Abbas speaking there, he seems to be pushing for a specific timetable on addressing the core issues of Jerusalem, of borders of refugees, whereas Israelis want to keep everything as vague and broad as possible. Have they even managed to establish a clear agenda for this summit in November? Well, clearly not. As we've seen from uh, Condoleezza Rice at that press conference, uh, she had really nothing to add apart from saying that uh, this was work in progress and there's still an awful lot of work to do. That's very diplomatic speak, if you like, to say that the, uh, the gap between the two parties negotiating the, uh, the statement or the joint declaration before the Annapolis summit have still got a huge amount of ground to make up. And Condoleezza Rice was saying they need to work together very aggressively. Uh, that shows just how much ground they've got to make up. And the issues are still very clear that are dividing the two sides. The Israelis do not want a clear timetable. They don't want any deadlines. They can always be uh, misinterpreted here in the Middle East. They don't, they don't want those deadlines or a timetable for final status negotiations after the Annapolis summit and there was no reference to any timetable or timeline in this joint statement. At the same time, they want to keep uh, the, the issues in the joint statement pretty vague. They're not going to uh, be looking at the core issues, nothing really concrete there, because the Israeli Prime Minister, Ehud Olmert, has got problems trying to keep his coalition together. And when you start talking about the return to the 1967 borders, the status of Jerusalem, the right of return of the Palestinian refugees, he's going to have uh, a lot of problems if he comes uh, to the table with this joint, uh, joint statement, uh, mentioning these issues and concessions made by his government in trying to keep that very government together. And at the same time, uh, the Palestinian president, Mahmoud Abbas, is under a great deal of pressure, not only from what uh, Professor Dugard has said of the humanitarian situation in the occupied territories, but also the fact that he needs a timeline, he needs a timetable, and he wants those core issues, those concrete issues, in this joint statement. So what we've got pretty clearly here is, uh, when we uh, poke through the diplomatic speak, is almost an idea of the huge divide between the two sides and that shows you how much ground the two negotiating teams have got to make up and remember the officials in Washington are even talking about uh, off the record postponing the Annapolis summit if these issues cannot be made up so at the moment uh, as Condoleezza Rice says the bilateral talks on this uh, joint statement have got to work very aggressively if the Annapolis summit is to be saved now, Godley's Rice also said the two sides should avoid taking any steps that would undermine um, Israeli-Palestinian peace talks ahead of the November summit. Was that a veiled reference to Israel's ex expropriation of Arab land? And do we know if she's been exerting any pressure on Olmert behind the scenes? Well, the Israeli government came out with a statement saying that uh, Condoleezza Rice accepted that they weren't going to make any concessions. Uh, she made a veiled reference to various issues that uh, could undermine the confidence and the momentum that's building. Uh, but I think the Palestinian president, Mahmoud Abbas, put it down very, very clearly. He said, he talked about the uh, confiscation of land in Abu Dis, which is going to be for this new so-called Palestinian highway uh, to uh, relieve the pressures built up by the, uh, by the wall that's being built by the Israelis, what they call a security wall. Uh, but at the same time, he also mentioned the fact that uh, the uh, excavations are beginning near the Al-Aqsa compound once again. 
and he's also said that he wants a reassurance that the Israeli settlements will not be expanded. All of these issues have always been there. They're still there, and they're still getting no guarantees that the Israelis are prepared to make any concessions or compromises on those. top story, another criminal investigation has been opened against Prime Minister Ehud Olmert. The allegations, conflict of interest, cronyism, and political appointments, all apparently perpetrated by Olmert when he served as Minister of Industry and Commerce under then-Prime Minister Ariel Sharon. IBA's Leah Stern has the story. Three criminal investigations are now underway against Prime Minister Ehud Olmert. The latest probe was ordered by Attorney General Menachem Mezuz yesterday on suspicion that Omar granted improper political favors, apparently appointing several unqualified Likud Central Committee members to key positions in the Small Business Administration and other government agencies. This while serving as Industry and Trade Minister between 2003 and 2005. In addition, Olmert allegedly intervened in decisions by the Ministry's Investment Center in order to help clients of his longtime friend and former partner, attorney Uri Messer, at Silicon Industries. Both probes are based primarily on investigations by the State Comptroller's Office and media reports. However, a preliminary inquiry carried out by police reportedly on covered new material that was not included in the comptroller's reports, and that is what apparently tipped the scales in favor of ordering this latest criminal probe. Olmert is currently under investigation in two other cases. He was questioned by police twice so last week over suspicions that he tried to rig the sale of Israel's second largest bank, Leumi, in favor of two associates during his tenure as finance minister. He is also under investigation for his involvement in a real estate scam in Jerusalem involving the purchase of a house on Crimea Street, where Olmert allegedly bought the house for a greatly reduced price. Olmert's office has denied all accusations and issued a statement saying, quote, these are unnecessary investigations. It's clear beyond any doubt that the investigations will yield nothing. News of the latest inquiry into Olmert's possible criminal activity came as the Prime Minister was hosting U.S. Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, preparing for next month's U.S.-hosted Mideast Peace Conference in Annapolis, Maryland. This is Leah Stern for IBA News. The head of the State Control Committee today called on Prime Minister Ehud Olmert to suspend himself due to the ongoing criminal charges he's facing. Member of Knesset Zvulun Orlev called for the police to accelerate their investigations in order to bring them to a speedy conclusion. No one, said Orlev, can run a country while managing three criminal investigations combined with the impending release of the Vinograd Committee report on the Second Lebanon War. Labor MK Ophir Penis Paz called on Olmert to immediately suspend himself. However, the Prime Minister did receive backing from his own ministers. Pensioners' leader, Rafi Eitan, said that there's no need for Olmer to suspend himself, while Public Security Minister Avi Dichter of Kadima said, I rely on the police to do their job faithfully and according to the instructions of the Attorney General. The One Nation Many Voices online film contest is calling you to pick up a camera and send us a short film about the American Muslim experience today. Up to five minutes in a variety of styles, comedy, drama, animation, music, documentary, and a special category for filmmakers 18 and under, plus a category for films less than 60 seconds. Winners receive $50,000 in prizes and a chance to show your film to millions of people on national TV through Link TV, YouTube, and on the web. Filmmakers of every age and background are encouraged to apply. Winners will be selected by celebrity judges. See the website onenationfilmcontest.org for details. The deadline is November 25, 2007. Remember, this is One Nation, Many Voices, stories, not stereotypes, about Muslims in America. Get more news about the Middle East online at linktv.org slash mosaic. The Mosaic webpage offers a complete archive of Mosaic programs, program transcripts, the Mosaic Video Podcast, and the Mosaic Intelligence Report, a weekly analysis of the hottest stories from the Middle East. 
The views expressed on Mosaic are those of the participating broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible with the support of viewers like you. Thank you. This program was brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. television network devoted to global and national news with uncompromising documentaries and diverse cultural programs. Programs which connect you to the world.